<clears throat> Welcome everyone. This is the Northampton Board of Health. Today is Thursday, January 20th. It's 534. Um, just so everyone is aware, this uh, Zoom is being recorded. Um, let me just bring up my agenda. Um, so um, we start the meeting with a public comment session uh, before the formal um, business meeting of the board will take place. And so for public comment session, anyone who would like to speak, uh, please raise your electronic hand. Uh, I can't see people, um, but I can see your electronic hand. So raise your electronic hand, please. That's in the reactions section at the bottom. If you would like to speak, um, we allow two minutes. Um, and then at the two minute mark, we ask you to wrap up whatever phrase or sentence you're finishing. Um, and that is so that everybody, that we're sure that everybody who wants to speak has an opportunity to speak. Once the public comment session is done, then we will open the board meeting. And at that time, the public, um, we are not, we don't interact with the public. So you can't intervene. If you raise your hand, we will not call on you. So if you'd like to speak, um, on any subject that is appropriate for the Board of Health, um, this would be your time. Um, so, okay, so we're gonna start with public comment. I see five hands up um, and I will call on people. <coughs> and then we will, un you ask me to unmute and then um, Suzanne, are you up for being timer? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, uh, first will be Amy, then Joanna, then Wendy, then JM She. All I have is your screen name, and Melissa, we'll start there. Uh, Amy? Yes, I'm here. It won't let me show my video though, but I'm, Correct. I'm here. Okay, yes, um, great. I'm Amy Kaling. I'm executive director of the Downtown Northampton Association, and I'm here to share concerns raised by many of the indoor venues here in Northampton. A couple of preliminary questions we had was how are you defining large and how are you defining venue? Does this include... Oops, wait, we lost you. Hold on. Hold on, we lost you. I'm, I'm back. I don't know. It said the host. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. now you're back. Go okay. Ahead. I don't know where I cut off, but anyway, how are you defining large? How are you defining venue? Does this include places like the grocery store, a gym, the Y? And if not, can you help us understand how you're drawing such a distinction? Also, is there data showing that large indoor venues are significant venues for transmission? And absent this data, why are large indoor venues being targeted with this restriction? Many, perhaps most of our large indoor venues have vaccine mandates in place. They've installed new air filtration systems. They require masks to be kept on. And in some instances, they've limited food and drink. COVID cases have been all but non-existent at these venues. So why are all of these steps not enough? Most indoor venues are already operating at a loss, far from anything resembling a COVID recovery. Capacity restrictions will mean canceled shows, additional lost income, the prospect of venue closures, employee layoffs, and lost revenue to artists. Another question, if a capacity limit goes into place, what will the metrics be to allow this to lift? These are not businesses that can easily open and shut at a moment's notice. They're scheduling weddings, concerts, performers, and they need to be able to plan out months ahead. We're asking that as you discuss any capacity restrictions, you please carefully consider the limited impact such a hyper-targeted restriction would have on community spread, especially as compared with the significant economic and mental health impacts any such restriction would generate. Thanks. Thank you. Joanna? Hello, um, I'm Joanna Farabee Walker. I'm the managing director of the Northampton Center for the Arts. And I have a quick statement to read. Uh, the Northampton Center for the Arts has been successfully offering COVID safety conscious programming in person since reopening in phase three during the summer of 2020, always following city and Commonwealth guidelines. Reinstating capacity restrictions such as the type we followed during phase three would place an undue hardship on our operations at this stage of the pandemic, especially given our community's vaccine rates and mass compliance. None of our current programming approaches our capacity limits anyway. 
Our largest venue, the Flex, has a max capacity of 200, but we have not come close to that since pre-pandemic. And we believe we can continue making educated, responsible choices about event management following CDC guidelines without additional restrictions from the city. Between the Northampton mass mandate and the 33 Holly vaccine protocols, we are keeping our visitors safe and don't see a need to limit our capacity to the point that we'd be forced to cancel upcoming events. The center has made it through the pandemic thus far, but going back to only being able to host events with 25 people or less in the flex would severely hamper our ability to operate and depending on how long the capacity restrictions were in effect could endanger our survival as an organization. We have received a lot of feedback from people about how grateful they are that we have continued to offer in-person pro programming. Those who aren't comfortable attending public events due to the COVID concerns simply don't come. We feel it is important to continue to provide opportunities for people to gather in community, again, while masked and fully vaccinated, since social isolation and loneliness is also a public health issue. For those who choose to continue to get out and about for the sake of their mental, physical, and spiritual health, we humbly ask that the city of Northampton not make it even harder to serve those people by reimposing capacity limits. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Wendy. Hi, um, Wendy Foxman, Ward 7. Uh, first, I wanna thank the board, Director O'Leary and the entire Northampton Health Department for taking care of our community for being proactive leaders during this pandemic and for the wisdom, experience, strength, and hard work you bring highlighted at your last meeting when you introduced yourselves. In addition, you listened, you reached out, you deliberated, you decided. This in reference to the vaccine passport, as it's commonly called. I'm glad to see you intend to consider adopting a policy for public comment sessions. Your prior meeting was overshadowed by an extensive public comment period, and when I say prior, prior to the one you last had, which highlighted a diversity of perspectives as well as both civil and very uncivil behavior. I have a few requests. Many of us were planning to attend your announced meeting the following week after that large meeting, that four plus hour meeting. Although it was never posted and technically could not be canceled, I will ask, should this happen again, you utilize social and other media to alert the public to the change in plan. I have since signed up via the city website to receive information from you and imagine this kind of information would be relayed in that. After your last meeting, I emailed your office and the city clerk to ask if the packet of materials accompanying your agendas could be posted similarly to the City Council's posting of agendas and accompanying materials. I hope you will consider doing so. I think the City Council's recent revised rules, particularly 4.7 and 4.8, relative to conduct and public comment are useful guidance for any policy you might adopt. In particular, civil and respectful conduct, a two minute per person address from members of the public with discretion to extend or reduce by the presiding officer. Last, I would also like to suggest for your consideration, you create a procedure where people who live, own a business, own property, or attend school here in Northampton are prioritized for speaking. I understand this may be difficult, especially in a virtual meeting, but perhaps an announcement of those intentions before each public comment period would be helpful. Again, thank you for your work. Thank you very much. Uh, J.M. She. Okay, now I can unmute. Thank you. I couldn't do it at first. The she is the pronoun. Sorry. <laughs> then, okay. Yeah, you see that in other listings as well. That's that's all that is. Um, my name is J.M. Sorrell. And I've lived or worked in Northampton most of the last 40 years. Um, so I definitely always have a, um, a vested interest in what happens. I want to, I do, I concur with the uh, previous speaker to thank the Board of Health and Health Director for a very, uh, and the Health Director staff as well, for a very um, respectful um, and um, interesting meeting last time. And I know it was under um, duress and difficult circumstances. You've been, uh, um, poked and prodded by the public and from all different angles. So hats off to you. I know your work is very hard. Um, I And whether I agree or not, I like your processing. Um, 
I wanted to just um, add to what some people have said about um, indoor venues. The mask compliance is pretty much non-existent. So it's, it's really a, a fantasy to think that those venues are safe if they're not properly ventilated and, um, and if people are eating and drinking. I am also a wedding officiant, so I can tell you, I've been told by couples, here's how the wedding's gonna be, we're all gonna be safe, and you show up and it's not. Um, so all bets are off once you're in the public. It's really hard, unless you're in New York City where New Yorkers take each other on if they're not complying. So it seems to work a lot better in New York City from what I hear. Um, and I just hope that we can at some point change the narrative in terms of choice because the choice right now seems to be for those who are unsafe and who are unsafe for themselves and for others. Um, the choice is not available to those of us who are more vigilant, who follow public health practices to feel like we can predictably go into the public arena and that everyone around us is going to be as cooperative as we are. So, it, and it reminds me of the, um, I used to work for the Mass Tobacco Control Coalition and we had to change the narrative from smokers rights to non-smokers rights. It takes time, but I'm hoping that that's around the corner. And um, I also wanted to convey to you that I know a hair salon that requires vaccines and booster proof, and they think they may be the only hair salon in Northampton doing this. Um, they have, um, I, I told the owner about your idea from Provincetown. She was all over it. She, she really would love to have something to post on her door that has kind of a stamp of approval from the Board of Health. Uh, this is Salon 241. Um, that's thank now on Mar Market Street. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Melissa. Hi everyone, um, uh, my name is Melissa Cleary Pearson. I'm the theater manager at the Academy of Music. And though much of what I'm about to say is reiterating what Amy and Joanna um, have already said, I just wanted to share my um, professional and personal experience working at the Academy this fall. Um, we've had a really successful fall being open. Um, I know numbers are different now than they were in the fall, but We've done everything we can to be as diligent as possible, um, checking vaccination cards, getting into the building, um, negative PCR tests. All of our staff, volunteers, and union hands are vaccinated. We have a mask policy when not eating or drinking um, and have installed Purell stations, new filters, ventilation systems. Um, we've also experienced um, very low numbers for this upcoming next six to eight weeks. Weeks. Um, we also have had sold out shows that have had a 30% attrition um, anyway, which have kind of allowed us to have some flexibility in seating and allowing people to socially distance if they want. Um, so in my experience as a front of house manager, even though things have been trying during these times, we've had a very good experience. Our um, Mental health has been improved since being open. We have had almost 18,000 people come through our doors in the last four months. And by capping audiences at this point um, would really uh, destabilize our business. Um, and not to mention that <laughs> residents would also have the options to visit other venues in other towns like Gateway City Arts, Fine Arts Center, MGM, uh, roller skating, ice skating at the Mullen Center. Um, so I would like to just stress the point that we have been really diligent so far um, with maintaining um, safety in our building and um, that, that we should continue going forward as we have been so far. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else, including people who just came in, who uh, anyone else who's interested in public comment? We're in the public comment portion of our meeting right now. I don't Joanna, see any other hands up. Joanna, yes. are there folks in the waiting room? I'm letting them in. I Thank don't. you. Meredith, is there anybody waiting? It doesn't seem to be now. Thank okay. you. If anybody would like to speak, they need to raise their electronic hand because the videos are off. Um, the, the, your electronic hand is found in the reaction section down at the bottom of your screen. If anyone would like to speak, now is the time. Oh, I see one more. Okay, Laura. 
Hi. Go ahead, Laura. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I, I attended the discussion last week um, and there were some things that I noticed and was curious about. Um, I think that during the discussion, you mentioned that the, the vaccines don't stop transmission. Um, and so I'm wondering how it's justified to talk about vaccine mandates as making people more safe. I mean, I know that's a very simple question, but I also remember hearing people talk about businesses and how, like restaurants, um, and how less people are coming to restaurants and that if people had the perception that mm -hmm. the vaccine mandates were maybe at play at that particular restaurant, then it would help them feel more comfortable <laughs> come. The question I have is, you know, social engagement, you know, being part of public life is, is a basic human right. So how are we talking about excluding people who don't want to take part in this experimental, arguably experimental medical intervention from public life? How are we justifying that in terms of just like accommodating people's perception that that will, um, that will make them safer because people who are vaccinated are also getting sick there, you know, and so Rochelle Walensky has said, we can't say that the vaccines, and she's the head of the CDC, has said, we can't say the, tran the vaccines stop transmission. Um, we can say they reduce severity and death. So I just, I, I don't quite understand how we are jumping to this, this narrative of the vaccine mandates are something that we should be putting in place. It just, it actually, it really baffles me. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else here who would like to comment? We're closing soon our public comment session. If any of the people who just arrived would like to speak in public comment, um, I cannot physically see your wave, so you'd have to use the reaction button and put up a hand, electronic hand, if you would like to participate in public comment. I don't see anybody else. Any other, anybody see anyone? All right, no. thank you so much for your comments. We do like to hear uh, from the public, we really do. And we really appreciate that you uh, took the time out to, uh, to come and join us this evening. Um, I think from here, our public comment session will be closed. Um, and then uh, we will move on to the business portion of our meeting. The public, um, you are welcome to uh, listen. It's a public meeting, um, but we will not be um, interacting sort of, it won't be a conversation. It'll be a conversation among the board members and staff. Um, so one last call for anybody who wants to have a public, um, two minute public comment. Okay, seeing none, I will close the public comment session. Um, would, um, and tonight we have um, uh, board members, Dr. Suzanne Smith, Dr. Laurent Levy, Dr. Cynthia Swopis and myself, Dr. Joanne Levin. We also have uh, departmental staff. We have Director Meredith O'Leary, sorry. Um, Assistant Director Amy Hutchins, um, our nurse Vivian Franklin, and I think Kelly is here somewhere, our clerk Kelly Constantine. Um, would someone like to make a motion to open the meeting? Move to open the meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay. Um, Northampton Board of Health meeting is open. It's 5.53 on January 20th. Let me get out my agenda. <coughs> okay. Okay. As we said, this meeting is being recorded. 
Um, we can uh, start with um, old business, our COVID-19 update. Thank you, Vivian. Go for it. Viv, we can't hear you. <laughs> no? Where's that? Where's that big microphone you were just? <laughs> no, it's not working. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I got my DJ mic. <laughs> okay. I'm going to share my screen now. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. I can. Lovely. All right. <clears throat> so, as always, I like to look at the whole picture of how things have been going uh, during the whole you know, two years that we've been dealing with this now. Um, so this number is ever increasing um, throughout the day really, but as of this morning, we've had a total of 3,394 cases since March of 2020. Um, we've had 135 total hospitalizations and 109 total deaths since Mar March of 2020. Um, as always, I like to input that hospitalizations and deaths data um, can be undercounted or incomplete um, for a variety of reasons. Vivian, can you just say what, uh, just quickly, I'm just curious, what is a probable versus a confirmed case? A probable case is somebody who had a proctored antigen test, so a rapid test that takes about 15 minutes and is looking for antigen Mm -hmm. of the virus. And a confirmed case is somebody who was tested by a laboratory molecular PCR test. Got it. Thank you. Um, so here's a close-up of our current surge that we are in. Um, you'll see uh, I circled the Delta surge, which at the time felt like a lot of cases, um, but now it's just paling in comparison to what we are dealing with right now, um, which you can see is still, still going up. Um, quite a bit. All right. Good graph. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so currently, since January 1st, and I'm using January 1st, you know, not just because it's the new year, but really we saw, if you look in our graph here, you can see that case has just really started skyrocketing at around January 1st, which makes sense because that was right after on um, the holidays, which contributed to spread, but also a lot of laboratories were closed on the holidays. Um, so we did have a little bit of a test delay there. So total cases since January 1st of this year, um, 1,078. I'm pretty sure that number increased um, since I ran this report this morning, um, but that already accounts for 31% of our total cases to date in this pandemic. Um, of those cases, um, 1,013 cases were confirmed by PCR. Um, as I noted in last week's meeting, um, this does not account for all of the cases that we have in Northampton at this time. Um, a lot of people are not able to get tested because there is such a demand for testing. Um, they may not be tested at all if they're asymptomatic or experiencing mild symptoms. Um, or they may only be tested with a self-test at home, which self-tests are not reported to the State Department of Public Health or local health departments. So they are not included in the data. Um, what we, you can see here in the graph on the right is that um, we definitely had the, most of our cases were um, in the week of the 4th to the 10th. We had 520 cases with a seven day incident rate of 263 cases on average per day per 100,000 people. Um, this past week, the 11th to the 17th, um, so far we've had a reported 351 cases with an incident rate of 178 cases per day per 100,000 people. So it's only a week's worth of data um, and this is a very quickly evolving situation, but we could be starting to follow on with trends that are being seen um, statewide and nationally of um, cases at least starting to kind of plateau. We're still seeing a lot of cases though. Um, so Dr. Lemon is probably gonna have a little bit more information on this too. 
um, but we do need to look at local hosp hospital capacity when we're talking about cases. Um, we have, an, a Cooley Dickinson has been hovering at about 20 to 25 cases um, when I've been speaking to them. And I think Dr. Levin would have um, more in-depth knowledge of what's going on there. So I, I can see if she can offer some input. Um, but in conversations that I've had um, with the hospital as well, um, they are still reporting to be at or over capacity. Yeah, so this graph shows our inpatient census of COVID patients. Um, and pr prior to this surge, our maximum was 21. And over this past weekend, I think we're up to 28. And then we're down to in the lower 20s during the week this week. So maybe we've seen, maybe we're turning the corner the other way. But as you know, um, hospitalizations are delayed compared to cases by a week or two weeks. And so it would take a little longer for us to see the trend in hospitalizations change as cases go down. Um, we still have a lot of staff out um, and we make our staff adhere to a more stringent guideline than the five days that the CDC uses. Um, so our staff may be out a little longer than, than the, you know, the way the public does it, um, but we want to be more sure that our, our staff is not coming back and then spreading COVID within the hospital. So um, uh, that looks like it's getting better as well. Fewer staff were out this past week than the week before. Um, so that probably mirrors the community rate. Um, and yes, our elective procedures have been suspended. I don't know if totally suspended or, or just significantly decreased uh, elective procedures requiring a hospital bed. So we are chock full um, and we have people being held um, down in uh, our endoscopy unit, which is next to the ER is, is used as an overflow area. And we have quite a number of people who uh, don't have a hospital bed who are being cared for in that overflow unit in the emergency room. Um, Vivian, anything else? Um, nope, I think you hit it. And I, I did want to note too, when we talk about elective procedures, um, they're simply, they're procedures that are not immediate emergent procedures. So these procedures can still be life-saving if done promptly um, and life-threatening if delayed. Um, so it, it's a really significant deal that elective procedures are suspended. Well, we would not uh, suspend anything that appeared to be life-threatening. Right. That would be considered urgent. So they, those are still happening. If you have appendicitis, okay. you can still go to the OR. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but if you've been waiting six months to get your knee replaced, you may have to wait a little longer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so vaccination coverage, um, unfortunately, is kind of stagnant. Um, we are, you know, still seeing a lot of people coming in for boosters at our clinics, um, as well as, you know, some still coming in for first and second dose. Um, but uh, overall in the community, the, the percentages have not, you know, increased dramatically, at least since last week. 78% um, of our total population is, um, has received the, the primary series. Um, and that's 81% of those who are eligible. Um, so that's our five years old and older are eligible to be vaccinated now. Um, so 81% of them have now you know, received their primary series. Only 46% of our total population um, has received a booster dose. Um, it's harder for me to speak to um, how many of our eligible population has received a booster dose since um, eligibility is determined not just by age, but also, you know, how long has it been since they got their primary series? Um, and then here's a breakdown of age. Um, you can see that individuals with, uh, you know, um, booster coverage, uh, does increase a bit as, um, age increases. Um, we also know that um, vaccine coverage is, it's not equitable across um, minority groups and the, the reasons are many um, and can differ between minority groups. Um, they're not, you know, the same reasons across the board. Um, 
we do work hard to increase access, but you know, some, some of the disparities in healthcare, health equity are deeply rooted um, and require just a multifaceted approach. Um, we do see that vaccine coverage is highest um, in our uh, white population and in our um, American Indian Alaska Native population and, and multi population and then um, is low in our Asian um, Black and Hispanic populations, but you know still above 50%. Um, this is a analysis of vaccine coverage among people who have actually tested positive. Um, so it is across the whole pandemic, um, the, the distribution of cases. Um, unvaccinated cases have made up the majority of cases. Um, and then we can see that we do have breakthrough cases in our primary series um, across all age groups. Um, and then we also do have breakthrough cases in our population with boosters, but they are much lower than our population who's unvaccinated. Vivian, is this all the way to the present? All the way to the present. So it goes, this is all the way back to March 2020. I do want to note that. So if I'm adding all the bars, I would get 3,400? 3, uh, in theory, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So Vivian, I don't know if this is easy for you to do for our next meeting. Might you be able to give us this graph uh, starting mid-December? I'd be able to do that. You'd be able to do that? Because yep. that would um, reflect our Omicron era. Yes, and I do have a breakdown of cases and um, clinical outcomes for, well, cases for um, the month of January so far when the surge really took off. I do have that in an upcoming slide. Oh, excellent, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Here we go. So I, again, I'm, um, I'm using the January 1st date um, really because at that January 1st date, cases started really ticking up. Um, so since January 1st, we can look at um, percent of all cases among um, unvaccinated primary series and boosted. Um, I do want to say as a disclaimer, vaccination data in our system can be, can have data gaps. Um, if a vaccine was not reported to our um, information database, or if um, some, you know, sometimes what can happen if is um, records can be mismatched, um, if some like demographic data is just a little bit off, so it doesn't feed in properly. Um, I will say if a case is hospitalized, um, I always make a point of finding out if they're vaccinated and not just taking um, their MAVEN record or, or disease database record at face value. Um, anyway, I digress. So if we just look at percent of all cases since um, January 1st, we do kind of have an even, a pretty even split in um, you know, individuals who are had the primary series, individuals who are unvaccinated, individuals who are boosted. However, um, Northampton is a highly vaccinated population. So when we have a variant that's as transmissible as the Omicron variant, we are bound to have a high volume of breakthrough infections. It's just, it's going to happen. Um, we also know that there, you know, the vaccines that we have are just not as effective against initial infection with the Omicron variant. Um, they were really designed with the wild type virus. So um, that said, we can see that both the incident of infection and the prevalence of infection for unvaccinated individuals is still four times higher just about than both individuals with um, the primary series of vaccine and individuals with the booster. So unvaccinated individuals, the incident rate of infection, the 14 day incident rate is 413 cases per day per 100,000 people. Whereas if you had the primary series, it's 87 cases per day per 100,000 people. If you had the booster, it was 120 days, uh, cases per day per 100,000 people. Um, and the percentage, so the prevalence of cases among the unvaccinated population 
since just since 20, uh, January 1st of uh, Thursday night brain, 8% um, of unvaccinated individuals in Northampton have tested positive just since January 1st, whereas 1.5% of individuals with the primary series have tested positive and 2% of individuals with the booster have tested positive. That's really, really interesting information. And I wonder um, if there, in addition to vaccination protecting people, if people in different groups behave differently. I, I'm suspicious of that as well. I admit, I think it's, it's hard it's, with any kind of data like this, it's not a controlled environment. Um, so we can look at that, but we, we should also keep in mind that maybe people who are, had the primary series and had the booster are more careful, but you know, somebody who's unvaccinated and not protected in that way may also be more careful for that reason. So it's, it's hard to know with certainty. Yeah. My guess is that each of these groups have mixed behaviors, but I wonder if they mean <laughs> one way or another. I think it's also very interesting that those who are the primary series, but not boosted are getting breakthrough infections at a similar rate. I can say that the breakdown, when you look at the second column, about half unvaccinated and half vaccinated or fully vaccinated uh, is similar to what we're seeing in the hospital. Um, and again, when you look at percent of cases, it's very misleading. But when you look at your last column, per, per, um, percent of all people in that category, how many of them um, tested positive, it's a very different story. Yeah, I will say um, in Northampton, um, and this data is on the state website if you're interested in it, um, our booster population is a little more than half that of our population with the primary series. So um, that, that could play a role. Say that again? Our, our booster population is about half that of it's the small. population with the primary series. Smaller. Mm -hmm. It's smaller. Mm -hmm. Same with the unvaccinated population, it's smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, Joanne, Vivian, I, I was wondering if behaviors could explain the, uh, an earlier graph that showed a higher number of cases um, uh, among boosted folks in younger age groups in, like, um, than, than older adults. And I wondered if it had to do with it being um, a working age population out of the house more, um, doing out activities out, out of the house more, especially, yeah. since, especially since boosted are, you know, less than half of those who received vaccination, but I think you had cases, not case rate, and the, 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 the cases were higher in, in, in middle age groups than in the, in the older adults. Yeah, and in general, we're seeing higher a higher number of cases among the younger age groups than we are in the older age groups. I, I think you're both right about behaviors um, being a factor. Um, I had a question for Joanne. Um, given that, uh, first of all, I just want to say this reminds me how humbling infectious diseases are. All, all of this um, just makes the mind boggle, but. Um, I wonder, Joanne, we have an 81% vaccination rate among those who are eligible for vaccine. Do you have any idea how many of the folks that are hospitalized are from Northampton and those, are for, those that are from outlying areas? Um, because with an 81% vaccination rate, you would hope that we would get some protection. Um, Vivian, do you have a feel for how many a day or how many you have? And I can, you know, put that over our total number. So how many are from Northampton? I have clinical outcomes overall. Um, what do you mean like hospitalized right now or hospitalized? Uh, like on any particular day, how many Northampton people are hospitalized on a, like two, three? It's some, yeah, it's, it's low. Like and, and the others, then the others are not from Northampton. Correct. So we're, we're running 2025 and many are from other towns. Ah, okay. Northampton's typically making up a small percentage of that. 
Thank you. That's Usually right. we have at least one person in there. Okay, thank you. I was hoping that that was the case. But as I said, Suzanne, if you look at the second column here, percent of all cases, it's very similar in the hospital group that it looks 50-50, those who got vaccine and those who didn't. But again, this is very misleading right. data. It, it looks at it in a funny way. And it doesn't really reflect mm -hmm. what's, what's really going on. Thank you. Vivian, I have a, a question. Just trying to wrap my head around the, the, those numbers. Um, it's, it's probably okay to say since January 1st, we have about 1,000 cases based on your earlier slides, right? Yeah. So the unvaccinated, that would be 450 cases, primary series about 310, and the boosted about 240. Is that, that sounds fair right. To say? And then if I take the population of Northampton, it's about 30,000, right? And then you said about 80% is vaccinated. That, so that's take, close to 23,000 have their, um, let me just double, uh, I don't have that open. That's, but I think it's close to 20,000 are, have our, you know, what we used to call fully vaccinated. Now we're going at the primary series. We like to keep people on their toes. Um. <laughs> so can we say that there's about 5,000 unvaccinated people? There is our, it's yeah, about 6,000. So is this 8% basically the 450 divided by the 6,000? Essentially. Okay. And how do you get the 430 cases per 100,000? 413? Yes. Um, it's a little bit of algebra. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have your, um, your X, your incident rate over um, the Northampton population, or over 100,000, excuse me, and then you have your daily average. So if I'm calculating it for seven days, I need my daily average to be the number of total cases in seven days divided by seven days. But is, it, is this 100,000 100, people of the population or 100,000 people of the unvaccinated population? This is of the unvaccinated population. And that this way we can compare the incident of infection across these different populations. Got it. Within North so Canada. if we have 1,000 cases in, uh, in a couple of weeks, right? So 400, 400, so that we could say about a third of these cases during that one week, right? So that would be 150 cases per week. Sorry, I'll take that back. 450 cases over about 20 days, right? That gives you about 22 cases per day. On, of unvaccinated people. So you're saying it's 22 cases per day of unvaccinated people and you divide by the unvaccinated. So you divide by the 6,000 to get that number. Okay. It, I think I, I, I can, if you want, I can, um, I can send you the equation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to do equation. I just wanted to make sense of it. Okay. Yeah, so I think I, I, reporting the bottom is, line is always I was just trying to figure out why the 87 and 120 are reversed with the percentage. It's just, it was just it's a little a smaller population. Yes, I, I think that's a driving factor there. Yeah, so what we don't see on this chart is the denominator, how many people are unvaccinated. So basically, you take the number of cases unvaccinated over the number of total unvaccinated people and then create a rate uh, based on that number. But that really illustrate, which I found to be a little bit tricky, is that really illustrate that you can present numbers in a way, you know, that can that can make a case of vaccination or not. And obviously, I want to see what what the numbers can tell, what the truth of number is. But you can, it 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 can be very tricky just because of that, because you have a, more people are vaccinated, far more people are vaccinated than are not. And, and, and you can claim, well, you know, 24% of people are getting cases. And that's pretty, this, this can be very misleading. I think the, the, the right-hand column is probably the, the one that talks the most. 8% of unvaccinated people have had a case versus 2% of the vaccinated people. And that's pretty clear. Yeah, and I think the reality of it right now is that we are seeing breakthrough infections. Um, I, everybody needs to be taking multi-layered approaches. You can't just 
you know, assume that your vaccination right now is a silver bullet because we have a very contagious virus circulating around. It does, you know, it just makes sense to take multiple layers of protection right now. Um, it will be interesting to see how these numbers shake out, or if they're the same sort of statewide when we have bigger numbers to go on. With the Delta variant, um, I think it was uh, a relationship of five to one, meaning vaccine with booster protected people um, unvaccinated had five times more, even though there was concern there was breakthrough infection that um, that having a booster uh, primary series and with a booster um, was protective, not totally protective, but was protective. So this is still early. We only have about two weeks worth of data, but um, right. that's very encouraging. Um, and I think it'll be interesting. Um, you have something similar or maybe for next time um, with uh, hospitalizations, vaccinated and unvaccinated. Oh yes, you're good. <laughs> so this, I think, is where our vaccines are really um, doing their, still just being very effective is with hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and I, I do have data on overall hospitalizations and deaths too. Um, I'll send you these. Don't worry, Dr. Levin. I I'll just want to be picture. able to look back at them. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go through it. All right. So this, I do want to say, is since the beginning of the pandemic. So there are other factors at play that I just want to be transparent about. Um, since the, at the beginning of the pandemic, we really we had a very low level of knowledge about the virus. We didn't have, um, you know, inpatient treatments that were, you know, really solid at the time. Um, but, and, and we didn't have vaccinations. Um, that said, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, 5% of our unvaccinated cases have ended up in the hospital and 5% of our unvaccinated cases have died. Um, individuals with primary series, 1.9% of them have ended up in the hospital, 0.6% of them have died. Individuals with a booster, 2.5% of cases have um, ended up in the hospital 0.3% of the um, cases have been, uh, died. Um, Quick question on the top line. Number of cases hospitalized, 5% of the 2171. Yep. And the next column is 5% of the hospitalized or 5% of the original number? Five, oh, sorry, would, yes. So five, those, those are percentages of total um, confirmed cases. Because that would mean that everyone who was admitted to the hospital died. Or right, no, no, no. <laughs> um, and I do want to say not everybody who died ended up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of nursing home cases who, you know, had they lived in the community, they would have ended up in the hospital. Um, instead, they ended up passing in the nursing home. So that data always looks a little funky where our hospitalizations and our deaths kind of match, where it looks like, oh, everybody who ended up in the hospital died. That's not the case. Um, and you can see that a little bit more clearly with our um, individuals with primary series and our individuals with the booster. Um, you know, our numbers of deaths, or, or uh, that says numbers, it should just say um, rates. Mm -hmm. um, but our deaths really um, are far fewer than hospitalizations. Um, and again, we have that interesting thing going on where boosters um, look to be, you know, reducing the risk less um, than with primary series. Um, so I do have the breakdown of cases by age as well. I know last week we talked about what we're seeing for ages in the hospital. I don't have as um, solid data on underlying conditions and how they predict hospitalization and death because that, that data is just hard to objectively collect um, in, in terms of this kind of data presentation. But um, so let's see, case fatality by age and vaccination status. Um, you are objectively looking at this, you are at much higher risk for fatality, um, or, you know, pretty much in all age groups, but um, if you are unvaccinated. Um, and then as you increase in age, your risk for fatality and your risk for hospitalization both increase, um, but less so if you are vaccinated and even less so if you have had the booster. But um, and then the, same with hospitalization. 
this slide is showing since the beginning of the pandemic. <clears throat> Correct. So um, <clears throat> I don't know how far along you are, but I wanted to focus in on kids. And so um, if I can ask a question about that, but maybe there's more to come. You can ask a question about that. <laughs> um, so the, um, we often don't talk about that population. So I'm curious, I forget in your slide if we know the percentage of kids five through, um, I'll say 18, um, who are vaccinated and also the positivity rate, um, which leads me to the question of how are we doing in the schools? What was your question? How are we doing in the schools? What, what's happening there? What's the rate of positivity in the schools? Oh, uh, I took out my school slide. Um, uh, schools, like every other sector, are overwhelmed right now. Um, we've had I, over 200 cases um, affiliated with the schools since January 1st, but a much lower number of those were actually in school while infectious. Um, a lot of those were reported um, in the week after the holidays, and they did not end up coming to school. Um, but we are definitely feeling the burden of the volume of cases in the schools right now. Um, and that, you know, that's all schools. That's not just Northampton Public Schools. That data I gave you was Northampton Public Schools. Um, all, all school programs are in Northampton and you know elsewhere are feeling it, including our um, pre-K and early child care programs. Vivian, have you seen transmission within the schools or is this mostly community transmission in school age kids? We have not had confirmed transmission um, within our schools. I will say it is um, very challenging to contact trace at this time. We are doing our best to um, do that. We have you know, all hands on deck doing contact tracing in the schools and a lot of surveillance testing as well. Um, most, I, I would say most of the transmission is occurring in the community, but we'd be, you know, kind of foolish to think that, you know, none of the transmission could be happening in schools, even if we're not confirming it, um, just because of just how much spread is going on. Um, transmission does occur in early child care programs um, due to the nature of, you know, how young the kids are, the kind of more direct hands-on care that they need, um, you know, less lower ability to, you know, consistently wear masks, and they are not a, va a vaccinated population. Vivian. And just just for the uh, Go ahead. sorry, Go ahead. Uh, just for the public's understanding, our our um, oversight of schools. I mean, we have we play a, a, a large role in advising schools. Um, I know I Meredith that. does, and you do as well. But a lot of their restrictions, when we talk about mandates or masks, etc., are pretty much coming from DESE. The Department of, of Education and the governor. Is that an accurate statement? I mean, we couldn't uh, go into schools and say, whoa, this, you've hit a particular threshold and you need to, you know, do something very different. Um, and I, I think Meredith would have input here too. It's a combination. Um, yeah. They get, you know, oversight from um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE. Um, and they also get a lot of consultation from us. They do let uh, our public schools, especially, like to make decisions in consultation with us. Um, but we don't actively set policies that the schools are required to follow. It's it's more of a conversation and a collaboration than that. Or strong recommendations. By or strong yeah. recommendations. Yes. yes. So we we sit on an advisory committee to the superintendent, and we bring the public health um, aspects into some decision makings and make urge, you know, and have strong recommendations. Um, a lot of times DESI and DPH and CDC weren't in alignment. And um, we had incidents where we would ask for um, DPH recommendations that were stricter than DESI. It, it was confusing for parents and community at times, but um, the public health measures that we were asking for um, we felt were important to keep the community safe and to keep the, the kids in school, so. Um, Meredith, can you clarify that um, in Northampton, we have a mask mandate for um, public indoor spaces and that includes school. It so does. If, 
if the governor or Desi were to say, okay, you guys can all take off your masks, they mm -hmm. would still fall under our mask mandate. Yes, and that's how it was at the beginning of the school year that we implemented that uh, policy in August. Um, and at the beginning of the school year, Desi did not have a policy requiring masks, but because they were Northampton schools, the staff and teachers and kiddos alike all had to wear masks. So that's a very good example. Thank you. Vivian, do you have an idea how those uh, school age cases are distributed across elementary, junior high and the high school? Because the 12 to 15 year olds have a very high vaccination rate, over 90%, as I saw from your previous slide. So I would hope that that would have, offer some protection for that age group. You know, um... In recent weeks, it's been, and I'm trying to, I had it written down on a notepad somewhere, but um, it's been pretty even across the board um, between, you know, obvi obviously the high school and the middle school have more students. Um, so they may have, you know, slightly higher cases, but it's been a pretty even distribution across the schools. And I, that's sort of, in tandem with what we're seeing in the community in general, we're seeing cases in all communities, all locations, all sectors are very much affected right now. But did you imply that you may be seeing more clusters and more cases in the early childhood programs? Where they're early childhood or programs are just much, yeah, like they said, they're just much more susceptible to spread. When we do see outbreaks in those programs, I'm talking about an outbreak of maybe two cases you know, where transmission happens between one person and another person. Um, it is rare in Northampton anyway that we've seen outbreaks involving an entire program that suddenly gets taken out. Um, so, you know, that's still really reassuring. And I, I know a lot of our programs take a lot of protective measures um, to protect their staff and their students. And all, are all the schools um, being offered uh, pool testing? Like they test all theirs or are some percentage of the students once a week? If they are particip if they are an EEC, like an early child and early childhood and education program, um, if they are one of those programs, they do get um, di participation in different testing programs, um, including pool testing. They can participate in that. Um, they can do symptomatic testing. Um, there's an EEC testing site that staff and students can go to. I believe it's in Springfield area um, and it's free testing. And um, additionally, now EEC is allowing programs to participate in sort of the early childhood program equivalent of test and stay, which um, the, the public schools have been doing since the fall. And that's with, uh, they're giving them rapid tests so that exposed students can stay and get tested daily? For five days, yes. So they have to test on five consecutive days and it's only for exposures that occur in the program. Mm -hmm. If they're exposed outside of the program, they have to do a standard quarantine. Um, Vivian, I had a couple of questions about the, this slide. Yes. Um, so what obviously makes it a little difficult to, to appreciate is that we don't have a good sense immediately for uh, the number of deaths that occurred, say, prior to, uh, let's say, June 2020. Yeah, so it's, it's, would you say half the death are about prior to June 2021, so prior to widespread vaccination? Is that yep. fair to say? So if we were to go back to that slide, um, we could say that some of those deaths, maybe half of these deaths, um, were of course among unvaccinated cases, but we were all unvaccinated people, correct? Yeah. So would we be, would it make sense to have two snapshots? And I'm just wondering how easy it is for you to do, um, because I'd be very curious to see what, what it says. You make a snapshot where you take all the data that happens uh, starting at a time where we all would have been reasonably vaccinated with two doses. So I figured maybe June, 2021. So you take everything that's before June, 2021 out and you keep all the case to the present. 
And then you do the same and you look at those distributions now by age and status. And then you would do the same uh, starting at let's say November, 2021, where we all had that opportunity to be boosted. Maybe it's this early December. And, and I'm, I'm now curious what that distribution would be, but is it still people in the seventies and eighties? Because I can't help thinking a lot of these probably, I'm sorry to say this in a crude way, but must have passed away early on. So I'm just wondering whether that distribution would not be as skewed towards old ages once you, you start to eliminate it, all cases prior to June 2021. Because I understand the message, you need to be vaccinated. But I wish we had a way of saying, you know, what are the cases of, un, you know, generally people that are unwilling, willingly unvaccinated? as opposed to, well, they were unvaccinated because they couldn't get a vaccine at that time. That doesn't make sense. I yeah, no, I, oh, sorry, I go ahead. I was say, for me, it doesn't matter whether they're willingly or unwillingly unvaccinated, but then you have the other group who have the vaccinated group to compare to. Yeah, go ahead, Vivian. Um, yeah, and I, I think that would, um, I, I've definitely done that kind of analysis, usually starting with July. Um, because at that point, you know, most of the people who, you know, could, wanted to get a vaccine could have gotten a vaccine. Um, and also that was roughly the time when we started seeing the surge associated with the Delta variant. Um, so I have done that analysis. I could certainly do it again. Not right now, um, no, no, no. <laughs> not on this meeting, but um, I could definitely put that together um, for a future meeting too. Um, I think it's more telling to look at um, deaths um, and the trend in deaths um, since not only um, since the first surge where we didn't really have a lot of um, effective known treatments and we didn't we also didn't have vaccination hospitalizations um, tend to I mean they're not going up as steeply as they did in that first wave in 2020 um, but they tend to still go up with cases, whereas we don't see deaths. Um, I mean, they do go up with, you know, subsequent waves in cases, but they're not going up at nearly the rate that they did. And I think that's a testament to both vaccinations and how we've learned to treat it once, you know, somebody has COVID, both outpatient and in the hospital. Yes. Yeah, of course. And the fact that right now, well, it's only the tail end of that curve that reflects Omicron, but that Omicron really does seem to be um, less severe. So even people in the hospital are not ending up in the ICU and on ventilators. So we do see that difference in the hospitalized patients as well. They're less likely to die. I definitely noticed that more people are in the, the med surge units, which are definitely over capacity, but um, not, not filling up the ICUs as much. Do I have more questions about this slide? No, thank you. I think that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Any other questions for Vivian? Thank you so much. These thank are you. fabulous, um, fabulous thank graphs. You, Great data. All right. Um, all right. Um, under old business, Something that was on our previous agendas was the consideration of granting emergency power to the health director. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Um, this was something I brought up just to make us a little more nimble since we our standard meetings are, are once a month, um, even though we have been meeting more often than that. Um, I think Meredith, you do have power as the health director to intervene where public health is clearly um, needs an intervention. Um, it's not exactly clear to me which things need our power and which things don't. Do you have an um, idea about that? Well, again, I think I can make strong recommendations um, the board can make the policies. Early on in uh, COVID, 
we, you know, we had these standard once a month meetings and things were happening so fast that it was rapid fire. Um, you know, on the daily, I felt like policy decisions needed to be made. So that's when the Board of Health decided to give me that power to make those policy decisions. As long as I informed the board within 24 hours of the said policy, and you guys had an opportunity to discuss um, if you wanted to. Um, so about a month ago, when we saw the um, the surge this surge starting again. Um, we had briefly talked about um, the matter of me having that power, giving the board giving that power back to me. Um, but I, in all honesty, I feel like we're at a point um, where hopefully soon, if we're not plateauing now, we will be plateauing and then being on it's at least the decline of this surge. So I think if we've made it this far without me needing to have that power, I suggest we just continue business as usual. Um, we've been meeting almost on a weekly basis now as is, and I think it's working. So that's my personal opinion. You're on mute, Joanne. Any other questions or comments about that? I guess it, it, my only question would be in the past several weeks, do you, did, did you feel that you were missing those powers at one point? And would that result in decisions that couldn't be made on time? No, absolutely not. No, and if there was something um, that, you know, I felt needed immediate attention. It was all about getting the stakeholders to the virtual table and discussing it and giving them data and evidence um, why it is I am making these recommendations and I felt like I was always heard. Um, so, no. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Um, I commented just about our meeting schedule. We might want to consider more meetings just to have them, um, but until we reach the plateau and go down. <laughs> so. And we okay. need three for a quorum, right? On the off chance. A three is a quorum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, review of our mask mandate. We have this as a standing item on our agenda um, as that mask mandate is continues to be active. Um, any concerns or questions or comments about the current mask mandate? Well, I think the data is telling that um, we continue um, having the mask mandate. One thing I think I asked consideration of, maybe it was the last meeting or two meetings before, was for the board to think about um, these large indoor venues um, and, uh, uh, you know, where they're watching a performance, seated watching a performance for allowed to take their concessions in uh, about maybe having or amending the policy where um, it would prohibit that in those type of venues. So if you are seated, you cannot take your concessions in to take off your mask to eat or drink. I think that... Um, is worth the discussion from the board members. So the I, I, I heard the Academy of Music mention earlier today that that's already their policy. I'm not sure what other large performance venues do, um, but I think it's a great policy right now. And it would be a, a short-term public health intervention. Can, can you say that policy against you essentially cannot eat while watching your show? Yeah, so if you're um, right, if you're in the audience watching a performance um, that you can't bring your concessions in and eat and drink during the show, you have to do that in a designated um, area for eating and drinking or outside. I'm pretty sure Bombix does that currently that they don't allow food and drink so that people will leave their masks on, but other venues do allow food and drink. Well, something like um, spare time, the bowling alley. Bowling now. Uh, I. Well, um, Cynthia, why do you bring that up? Um, I was thinking like. 
performance. Oh, because concerts. It, oh, they have bands inside, right? I'm I'm not familiar with the type of entertainment that's there. I'm just um, thinking about it being a large venue with a focus of some type. I just don't know. Oh, I was thinking more of venues like movie theater style seating, you know, rows of seating on top of each other, um, people outside of your um, family or social pod sitting next to each other, um, just the risk of transmission when they're taking their masks off to eat or drink. I wasn't, I in my thought, I wasn't thinking about a bowling alley falling under that. Or some uh, restaurants or bars that have bands and dancing. Would that not fall under that? Um, I think um, it's wise in the, I don't know how we would clarify what that large venue where people are seated close together, how we would clarify that. But that seems to be a place where I, I do think it makes sense that people need to wear their mask um, and not be taking off to eat or drink. Um, like auditorium and, style seating is what I'm thinking of. How many venues fit that definition? Uh, Amy actually put a list together um, last week and maybe she could think of what would fall under that definition, like the Calvin Theater Academy. Yeah. The Calvin, the Academy, Bombex was new to me. I, I think it's a 200 person venue. I'm not quite sure with that. Mm -hmm. um, the Calvin has just a few events. The Academy had most, um, Pearl Street doesn't have any events planned, but it is an event that would fall into that. Um, I'm trying to think if there was one more that was in that large scale and they didn't have events either. The Iron Horse? Iron Horse does not have events, correct. Um, well, at some point they may. Right, right. But at this time, I think I looked out uh, two months. Isn't the Iron Horse the point is sit and eat while watching this show? I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a restaurant, not the greatest, but. So I guess that would be different from um, auditorium style seating where people are really seated shoulder to shoulder as opposed to sitting with your group uh, and eating with your group. So we're there's talking- no, There's no auditorium style seating at the Iron Horse as far as I remember. Right, right. But there is at the Academy, the Calvin, Bombix, I haven't been there, but I think that's sort of pews that used to be a church. So we're talking about perhaps three venues and two of them appear to already have that policy. Didn't, wasn't it determined? Bombix has it, I don't think the others do. And uh, there's the Holly, the, Holly the Street Academy. has events. I thought the Academy was already doing that. The Academy okay. is already doing that. The Academy is already doing it. So, mm -hmm. we're, so we're, it's already being done. The Academy is, doesn't offer food or drink? No, they eat in the designated area. They don't take it to the seats. And Bombix, I think, does that as well. Holly Street, I don't think has that policy. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with that one. That's the Arts um, Arts Council um, okay. building on Holly Street. They have events. They probably don't haven't had a lot of events, but they have a space where they set up chairs. And so they could have events where they're sort of set up auditorium style. Do we want to make something like that a recommendation as opposed to a regulation? I think that would be more appropriate, especially since it's being done voluntarily already. And it would be a reminder to those that are not doing it that that's our recommendation. Doesn't sound like a policy is warranted. The venues have already, have already gone ahead with that. And also include under that recommendation, um, you know, uh, strongly encouraging the KN95s or ND4 masks or surgical masks or um, discouraging cloth masks unless it's double layered or has a surgical underneath it. 
Um, the CDC came out with updated guidance last week. Wouldn't that dictate that they would have to provide masks because people would arrive at the venues with whatever masks they have? And we've been helping the downtown businesses. Um, uh, we have given Amy Kayleen, I think, almost 10,000 masks, KN95 masks, so she can distribute to the, uh, the downtown businesses and they know to contact her if they need them. Um, they've been primarily for staff for, for these type of venues. If they're having trouble um, procuring those types of masks, they can certainly reach out to Amy or myself. Thank you. So, well, Ma Cynthia? So, Meredith, what's your, you introduced this with auditorium style seating. Mm -hmm. And what it sounds to me like, and I, I don't have a bowling background, so I don't, I don't know what goes on there, but um, it sounds to me like what we're really talking about is a venue where eating is not the primary reason people go there, so, you know, such a rest, as a restaurant or a bar, because um, people are close in a bar, <laughs> so it could be just as close as auditorium seating. So it, it seemed to me that the kind of venues we're looking at is where food is not the primary reason for going. Does that make sense? As opposed to the auditorium seating. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you bring up spare time, Cynthia. The manager of spare time happened to be on the morning news this morning. And he was discussing how very difficult the mask mandate has been for him and his staff. They're, they're working hard at it, but he said it's very, very difficult. So right. from, the, from the perspective of um, patrons not putting on their masks or wanting to put on their masks? No, I want to keep them on. I want yeah, to wear yeah. them proper. Mm -hmm. Other comments? I support a recommendation. Um, we talked. We talked last meeting about recommendations for businesses, and I, I understand Meredith and the staff working on um, recommendations for businesses, and I, I would include that among the recommendations. It's actually just a masking emphasis and a reminder of how important that is still, even if they are venues that have a vaccine mandate. I think it's, um, I would sort of stress that if food in that kind of venue, which is auditorium style seating, I guess, if you want to call it, or concert kind of venue, which is not a bar or a restaurant, um, that if they want to serve, because some of them, some of their, they make their money serving beer or, you know, serving alcohol. Um, if they want to um, serve uh, food or drink, it would need to be in a different area so that people going to the venue can choose to be in an area where it's mask only um, and where the concert would occur would be mask only. Um, that's, that's sort of how I think of it. Um, that would require understanding the configurations of the, of the venues and the buildings and their spaces, which I don't have the information about. I would propose that if they can't separate uh, food and drink serving from the main concert area that they not serve food and drink. I mean, I think having people so close together uh, if we're not going to do an occupancy limit, then then people need to keep their mask on. I mean, right now, particularly with Omicron, they should have their mask on. Um, and it's up to the venue if they have a spot, a you know, side room or outside or however they want to do it to uh, serve food and drink. Certainly in the summertime, doing it outside would make most sense. Um, but during the concert, um, to me, it makes sense. And, and it I think it would make perhaps improve business for people to know that everyone in that venue is going to be wearing their mask. Um, I'm trying to understand why are we separating um, sitting auditorium from 
a progression of the Bishop Lounge when I'm watching a concert standing up with a beer in my hand and presumably my mask on. Are they having events? And yeah. I'm just wondering whether it, it, it's, it's very practical, that's all. I Beyond that's reminding people do wear a mask to the best of your ability um, and you know, hoping for the best as opposed to, I, I, I found this recommendation to be too targeted because it's a sitting auditorium, that's why. Because if we start with a sit, sitting auditorium, reasonably we should immediately start going and you know, thinking about you know, you, your concert in a pub. Well, I feel like my concert in the pub, I can move away from someone who's not wearing a mask where if I have a ticket in a seated auditorium at a performance venue, that's my seat. And those people around me are, whether they're masked or not, they're either choose to leave the venue or that's, that's what I get. So I think that's my difference that I was thinking about. Um, and if you don't have a capacity limit and we don't have six feet around from one another, um, that during this time of Omicron, that there's gotta be some type of requirement and I, or prohibition of taking that mask off. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I was making that recommendation where it was coming from. Yeah, I think the bar and restaurant issue is really complicated because people, what do you call actively eating and drinking? If you're holding your beer, do you have your mask on between sips? Or anytime you have your beer in your hand, it's okay to have your mask off. I think it's just too many gray areas, which is unfortunate because, you know, having a mask off is a risky proposition in the time of Omicron right now. Um, but I do think that um, in a concert style venue where people are shoulder to shoulder, I think this makes some sense. That would be very hard to define. What would be? A, a concert venue where you're shoulder to shoulder. Well, as you mentioned, audit auditorium style. Oh, auditorium, theater. okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. As opposed to a bar or restaurant where gotcha. people may be mm -hmm. standing or in groups mm -hmm. or in at smaller tables. So uh, seated, perf yeah, yeah, audit, I don't know. I, I just use that for lack of a better word, auditorium seating, indoor performance venues. I, don't I, I guess what, um, I, I, I'm fine with the recommendation, but you know, there are so many more recommendations that we can make because um, of this mask issue. Like when, when you're eating in a restaurant and you sit down at the table, that doesn't automatically, that doesn't automatically mean mass off until you pay the bill. You know, there's so many other recommendations we can make. And I, um, I, um, I think we're doing, um, we're providing some good education by doing this, but I, I hope we're not just picking and choosing the lowest hanging fruit <laughs> um, because people are still vulnerable, right? They're vulnerable as soon as they take their mask off. And so should we, um, re-up our recommendation about keeping the mask on. I, I don't know, and I, I appreciate the um, uh, the proprietors and the staff that are in the middle of this situation where they, they seem to keep their masks on and yet their customers are not, so. I guess uh, in my mind, a mask, wearing masks in a restaurant, it's not clear at all what the rules should be. I mean, mm -hmm. when you're, what is considered actively eating or drinking, I would not have thought to put my mask on between bites. Um, but once my food arrives or when I'm drinking my water before the food arrives, um, like well, what should we be doing? I mean, the truth be told, I'm not eating in restaurants now. Um, and that's, I guess, you know, some self, a lot of self-selection is happening now. Um, and I, I do feel bad for the restaurants who are having a hard enough time uh, financially, but also 
for people walking in, asking them to wear a mask, and then you know people complying, people not complying, and then when they sit down, being able to take off their mask, but they should put their mask back on when they get up to go to the bathroom. But do they? I, I think compliance and enforcement is a big problem mm -hmm. in those kinds of settings. Um, can I jump clarity. in? Clarity, yeah. Can I jump in for a second? So um, Inspectional Services is trying to work on some tools for the for the restaurants and businesses. And I'm kind of listening to what you're saying. And one of our tools is to provide them like a template of a COVID policy. They don't have to sit down and think about it. And we thought the best way, because they all do things a little bit differently, was like a, a, a checklist. Like we can do that. That fits our, our, our business or restaurant. So I was just trying to find I have different categories, but we have uh, additional best practices. And under restaurants, we put this little checklist, promotes public wear, mask at all times while in the restaurant and business. Enforce public to only take masks down when eating and drinking. Enforce public to wear masks while servers are at their table and serving. So they, if they do all that, they would check it off. Um, if it applies to them, they would check it off. I, I could add to that, you know, when they are moving around the, you know, the restaurant and, and make that a little tighter. So it's, you know, here's this COVID policy. It's, you know, all of it is recommended. You can use parts or pieces of it. Um, you, it's not something we're enforcing that you have, but we're trying to make it easy for them to have these ideas and, and put them into place. Amy, is this something that the establishments could hang on their windows or in their doors so the public could view like these are the policies that they're enforcing or is that what it's, it's a, meant for or is it more internal use for the establishments? That's a good question. It's a little longer because it really covers a lot. It's very bulleted. Um, I know like for our, our inspections that we do, it we, we always have them um, I think it says, ask uh, our, our last and most recent inspection is available upon request. So if that's a sign they wanted to put up, our, our, our most recent COVID policy request, it would be able, it would be something that they could show the public, we have these things in place. Um, it's our policy. So maybe that would be the way to do it. Unless so, there was like an, a different kind of attestation of what they were doing, but this would more show the specifics. So one thing I wanted to begin a discussion of that I thought would be a separate issue, but I'll bring it up here, is that I thought we would make a subcommittee to work on best practices for businesses. And maybe we could work together on that and, and sort of figure out, are they gonna use this internally? Is there some kind of checklist? some kind of verification that Department of Health can give restaurants and they can get a star if they do this and this and this, and the public would know who's complying with best practices and, and who isn't. So I think um, I'd like to make a subcommittee uh, that works on this and then we can, and we can include some businesses to sort of find out what would work for them, something public, something that they use privately, something that Board of Health would keep a list of restaurants or that you know, that adhere to these best practices or, or some kind of verification thing, you know, so many possibilities of how we would, would do that. And, and if I can add, uh, the reason why we thought that this was an important thing to put together, um, it kind of came about from having a conversation, being part of a conversation with Amy Kaling and all the questions that were coming uh, to her. Also all the questions that we get within the office. And then our inspectional staff reached out to a good group of businesses that reflected uh, different populations to say, what do you, what, what do you need? Um, what questions that you get asked? So uh, in conjunction with this, we also have like this Q and A fact sheet of a lot of those questions with solid answers to kind of, oh, that makes sense. Or what is that right, right now with CDC, um, the best mask to be wearing. So I think that will be really helpful. So. It's really close to being done. So if you wanted to do that subcommittee, we could show you what we already have in place. Awesome. Or not in place, it's not quite in place yet, but it's, it's in, in work progress and real close. Just a reminder that if two of us are involved, it has to be a, a posted public meeting. 
Yeah. Yes. So, so it would be a subcommittee um, meeting and it could involve two of us, but it could not involve three of us because otherwise that's a board of health meeting. Um, so it could be two of us and Meredith and Amy and um, I, I thought if two of us were together, it still had to be posted. posted. Yes, it needs to be posted, but it's not a it can be a subcommittee as opposed to once we have a quorum, it's a board of health meeting. Correct. Or Joanne, we could have one person from the board work with the department. Yeah, I think we're allowed to have two. I check with Alan Seewald. We're allowed to have two of us um, working as a subcommittee um, and that would be a posted meeting. Mm -hmm. But does not need public comment, but it's public meeting. Right, but if only one board member worked with the health department staff, it wouldn't be open to the public. I think okay. that's what Cynthia was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we could start that way and then see where, there, where that leads. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to incentivize the best practices through some sort of funding from COVID funds? And how do we do that? Let's say you want to upgrade your HVAC system and you get a star for having an HVAC system in place. Uh, and some of the uh, COVID relief funds are made available for that. Can, can we do something like this? Same thing for, I, I, I don't want to take this off the table, but if some establishments were willing to put in place a vaccination requirement, um, can we incentivize that? We cannot. That's a decision that would have to come from the mayor. We don't, I mean, there's ARPA funds available um, for economic relief for the businesses, but I don't know the intentions on how they plan on using it. I did submit when the ARPA funding questionnaire was put out last fall, I did submit a request for ARPA funds for businesses to upgrade their ventilation. Um, I would love to see a ventilation consultant be available uh, for businesses and then ARPA money uh, spent in helping small businesses um, you know, improve their ventilation. Is it the sole discretion of the mayor or is that city council? I'm not sure. Um, but I think that our first, the first task for us would be to help establish best practices. Um, so, um, Maybe Amy, maybe you and I could meet or uh, with Meredith um, and sort of go over what you've got because um, I have some ideas as well. Um, but I really also wanted to flesh out how the best practices would be used, meaning are we gonna have a star system, sort of public system where people can know which businesses are doing best practices or are we gonna be, is this just for internal use? Um, exactly what, what would incentivize businesses to do best practices? So I, I, I know we, we don't necessarily wanna get into a vaccine mandate discussion, um, but I, I still wanna circle about this because I, I, I really feel that in reviewing all these comments, they were a very important part of the population and some of us can among our contacts, people we know who've brought up that argument, which is, I am not going to go out until I see that there's a, a vaccine requirement at this place. And, and as I indicated, you know, it, it was the roost experience when I talked to them that at least a number of the patrons had started to come because they saw that requirement and they felt reassured. And again, we're talking about reassurance. We're not necessarily talking about a public health decision because I think we settled that last week when we talked. But I'm still wondering whether, um, you know, it's it, it. In some instances, it could make business sense for people to have that in place with that guidance. And I'm I'm wondering whether you know I I want to continue beating the drum on this and perhaps either write to the Gazette or go to City Council to make a comment. Um, but I, I wanted to know what the opinion of other board members is on this um, because I'm not sure I'm you know I'm prepared to do it alone. What's your can you say uh, what your proposal is? 
Well, like a couple of things. One is to go and talk to city council to, to sort of raise awareness that some business should do that. And they will probably get clients as a result. And don't think it's a, you know, not, it's not a one size fits all, but I think some businesses may think it's a, it's a good decision that they will get additional uh, patrons if they, if they put a mandate in place. I'm not, I'm not suggesting perhaps they could do a partial mandate some days on and some days off. I don't know. I, you know, they can think that for themselves, but I'm trying to figure out how do we publicize this? Is I, I you know, out of all those comments that it was something that was coming back over and over again. I have not gone out since March of 2020. I'm afraid. I want to be, feel that everyone's vaccinated around me. And again, it's a matter of perception. Uh, I'm afraid when I take the plane and I know it's much safer than driving my car. That's kind of the same type of behavior. And, and obviously we can't necessarily make decision and, and, and regulation based on fear. Uh, we need to, it needs to make sense from a public health perspective. But I still think that something needs to be done to reassure people and to perhaps give that opportunity for those people to go out again and dine out and have a social life. So if a number of establishments put that mandate in place so that, you know, much like Amherst Cinema or uh, The Dirty Truth, or um, it, it would be great. So I wanna see if as a board, we can help move that forward and push that along. Personally, I would include a vaccine and booster requirement in best practices. That's not a mandate from us, but it's a recommendation from us and, and businesses can choose. And I'm sure it's more appropriate for some businesses than others. And some businesses will increase their patronage and others might not. Um, so in the list of best practices, I think we would include that. I don't know if there's anything more you would want to do um, than include it in our recommendations of best practices. I think, I think Lauren is talking about how the public will be made aware of this. Um, yes. And, and I think that we, we've had a couple of ideas floated previously. One was a sign, signage for the door that, uh, and I've, I've seen a, a draft somewhere, maybe it was from Provincetown or mm -hmm. something, that said, I, I thought the Provincetown one, frankly, was a little long. I, I think it just needs to say, you know, we're requiring we're requiring vaccines to come into our establishment because we care about reducing COVID or something like that. And also whether we could have a list of establishments that require vaccines on the city website as a public health um, announcement not necessarily a business endorsement announcement, but just these, these venues are requiring vaccine. And that would then, and, and, and sure we could alert the Gazette that this, this list is available. And um, people could then become aware by walking by the, the outside of the establishment, uh, by finding out that they can check the city website and those would be a couple of ways I, I think we could implement relatively quickly. I agree with those ideas. I think those are great ideas. I think um, when, if I were to meet with Amy and Meredith, I think we would sort of put, put that all together into sort of a, a package. That's how I would view it. So create this best practices and then figure out how they're gonna be publicized, how they're gonna be verified with a business that, you know, are they vaccinating their staff? Um, I think the, uh, I have some of the documents from Provincetown. I think they did document who's on their staff and document that, that they were all uh, vaccinated in order for the Department of Health to say, yes, this business doc, you know, documents vaccination for all their um, staff. So that would be another point of best practice. So I think all of those issues would be um, things we can include in this package. Um. Pardon me for a second. I need to go to council meeting. So I'm going to designate um, Kelly. You're going to be the host and you'll get the recording of the meeting. Okay. 
Meredith, can you wait a minute? Do you have you have a couple okay. minutes? I can. Do we can we talk, can we bring up the topic that um, that you were going to make a recommendation on before you go? Which one was that? Occupancy. Um, you guys can discuss it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So what's, what your, the what's your proposal? What's your proposal? <laughs> I didn't have a proposal. Uh, what did the agenda items say? Re remind me. Been a uh, long occupancy limit, uh, um, capacity limit in large indoor venues. Right. Okay. Um, I I put that on the agenda just because I, I heard public comment, it's very hard for me, you know, to kind of compartmentalize public health and, and economy and, and our businesses and what's good for them. Um, I, I feel like taking a step back and setting capacity limits would be in the best interest of public health. But what I'm also hearing, and I heard from Amy is, A, there's very few shows that are happening a lot have been canceled or postponed till later months and this is just for public events not private events um and is it really worth the the few shows that are left to do that or just let the consumers make the decisions on whether or not they want to take the risk to go to the venue um if we have you know if we are reinforcing our recommendations on masking if we're thinking about you know when seated in these auditorium style settings not taking off your mask to eat or drink i mean a little give and take there um and again it anything that you did if you did something would just be um very short term until we're on the other side of this which you know seems like it might be on the horizon so that's why it was put on the agenda item for you guys to discuss. I mean, it, it's, it's you know, I, I feel like at this point where we're at two years in, um, people are making their own decisions, you know, um, based off their own risk on what they're willing to take, you know. Um, many of us on this panel probably don't go in, you know, indoor dining. Um, we choose where, um, where where we are going to have our risks and not and maybe that's the same and we just leave it alone and not have a capacity policy for the indoor venues i just checked before the meeting started um in new york city with all of the restrictions and mandates that they have in place for broadway shows vaccine requirement and a mask but they haven't reduced capacity Mm -hmm. Do you know if they still serve uh, food and drink at this at your seat? I guess the different theaters used to do that. Some some did, some didn't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Meredith before she goes? She's presenting at City Council tonight. Thank you, Meredith. Thank good you. luck, Meredith. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. All right. Have a good night, everyone. I'm going to make Kelly the host. Um, so, uh, any thoughts or comments about um, the proposal for limiting occupancy? It's not a it's not a formal proposal. It's an agenda item for discussion. Um, any further discussion? I, th I think I I'm, would love to see us aggressively go down the best practice route. Um, before we start applying um, some restrictions. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, this is, this is about the public's health and we're going to give our best information to the public. Um, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so let's, I'd love to see what the best practices are. And then we can think of a, perhaps this uh, award or reward system for it, but, um, I don't think there's any award um, strong enough <laughs> other than to have that moral imperative that this is the right thing to do. And I know that that's from our perspective and not everybody sees it that way, but I am intrigued with, you know, 
uh, putting money into an HVAC system is so tangible and makes so much sense um, that that would, you know, that would be something that that complements all our goals. So, um, but I, I would vote for putting off the capacity discussion. Um, it seemed like Meredith was, you know, not really actively pursuing that um, and um, see what we can come up with with the best practices. I think Meredith's thought was that if we were interested in doing that, that would be something for short term and sort of now while we're in sort yeah. of the height of things and a month or two from now, it may not be appropriate um, yeah. any longer. Um, so if we don't want to do that now, then, um, you know, I don't think a month from now we're going to have an interest in it either. So any other comments? Um, do we want to go back to um, sort of I interrupted our discussions because Meredith had to leave. Do we want to go back into sort of the plan for best practices? Um, are you guys okay if I meet with Amy, maybe with Meredith to start? Yep. Um, and then either bring it back to the whole board or if we needed to make a work group uh, public subcommittee um, to work on it further before we bring it back to the group, something like that to start start there. Um, I, I think there's some urgency for this. Um, if God willing, the rates are actually coming down, um, we would be missing the period of maximum impact if we don't get something to businesses soon. Well, I think, um, I'm not sure how quickly we can get this together. I mean, we can get together a list of best practices pretty quickly. I think having an award system or reward system or signage or that kind of thing would probably take a bit longer. But to start, perhaps we could come up with our list of best practices and put a letter to that effect, uh, send that to businesses or put it in the Gazette, something like that, and then come up with a more formal Board of Health sanctioned system of some kind. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, I think so. All right, so Amy and I will make a date. Um, and then um, at the end of this meeting, we'll decide if we want to meet more uh, sooner than we had already, uh, than is our standard um, next meeting um, to sort of move that along more quickly. And I think it, it, would, it would make sense if we're using that approach, you're going to talk to Amy and Meredith that um, that we meet twice a month for the for the next couple of months. Um, yes. Okay. To the yep. extent we can all sustain it. And if we miss one, we can always meet a quorum by th with three. But I think it, it, it makes sense. And it's also a way of keeping the public informed of what, what, about what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Um, great. So I will meet with uh, Amy and Meredith and sort of we'll come up with best practices and then we will meet. Um, I don't have our date of our next meeting, but I think it was um, our usual third Thursday of the month. So we can just on that. 17th. I, I just want to add mm -hmm. one comment. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, obviously, you know, it seems that if the Omicron wave is receding, as I'm starting to hear, um, I, I mean, the point is not really to catch a receding wave. It means that that wave is playing itself out. I, I think really what we, we should have a bigger picture, which is um, we, we sort of developing this, realizing that perhaps this is not over with and we have to live with this in the long term that they might be another variant and it might be a milder one. It may be a different variant, but we have to leave with this. And what do we do for those best practices to be, um, to be long-term solutions? Uh, because we can't, <laughs> a quick fix is not gonna really make a, 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 a it, it's not gonna help because it might be a quick fix in the middle of, uh, you know, at the bottom of the wave before the next wave and become completely uh, inadequate for the next wave. So that, that's really what I, I was thinking. I totally agree with you. And it's sort of, I feel like the cat is out of the bag or whatever the expression is uh, on this Omicron wave and it came on so fast and we didn't really have 
the ability or the I don't even know what what the right public health move would have been or or is because it's so transmissible. There is nothing to do except stay home. And we made those recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I do think that we will be living with this disease for a long time. And I unless we have a new variant that sort of pops up unexpected the way they've already done, um, we can expect that to happen. And even if we don't have a new variant, I somehow will expect that we'll have, whether we call it a surge or a bump or something, uh, which has happened both this year and last year in the fall when people start going indoors and socializing. Um, so I think this is all in preparation for living with this disease and making our spaces as safe as possible. Um, and I think, again, these best practices of vaccine, vaccination, wherever we can enforce it or encourage it, um, ventilation, best practices with masking, all these things, um, we can get into place. Um, I think it's likely, unless we have a new variant, that the summer will be seem very lovely and we have opportunities to, to be outside and to socialize outside. Um, and by the, I'm very concerned about next fall. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. Um, so do you want to set up a, another date now since we're talking calendar? Um, if our standing meeting is on the 17th and we are now there, do you want to meet in between? Would be Thursday the 3rd. Third. Any... Uh, does that work for everyone, Suzanne? Um, I'll have to rearrange something, but I think I can do that. Cynthia? That's good with me. Lauren? That's good with me. Okay, our next meeting will be February 3rd. Hopefully that will work for Merida. Um, and in between, Amy, you and I will we'll figure something out. All right, one other thing that, we, um, that I thought it was important that we do um, is to talk about our policy for public comment. Um, and I sent to you a document which shows the um, policy that, that was adopted at city council. Um, so uh, I have not heard from the new mayor's office, but I suspect it will be the same, but the mayor, previous mayor, had required a public comment session at all um, city board meetings, but there was no other directive. We could choose how we did it, how many minutes, how many per person, how many minutes total, like whatever we wanted to do. Uh, so attorney Seawald recommended that we develop, um, thank you, Vivian. Um, attorney Seawald recommended that we develop rules for our public Public comment sessions so that everyone knows the rules ahead of time. We obviously we can't change the rules based on the topic we're talking about or, you know, what day it is or whatever. So we have to have standard rules. Um, does everyone have this document? This um, there's a paragraph um, on public comment uh, that the city council adopted, and we can take that if we want. Um, we can also, we are allowed to ask participants to sign up prior. Attorney Sewell did say that if you have a sign up process, you also need to be able to sign people up during the meeting. So we would have to have uh, Kelly or somebody admitting people with the sign up process during the meeting because people are allowed to enter during the meeting. Um, we could also have some flexibility by the presiding officer you know, making changes. Um, so I'll just read the rule that was adopted by city council um, about public comment. It says members of the public may address the council and all council committees on any matter for a period of two minutes. This period may be extended or reduced at the discretion of the presiding officer. Public comment may be accepted for no more than 90 minutes. Whenever language translation is required for a member of the public to address the city council, such person shall be provided four minutes. Individuals wishing to speak will be recognized by the presiding officer and shall state their name and city or town of residence and optionally their address. 
Councilors will not respond to any comments from the public. The city council will take public comment in person or by remote participation as the technology allows. Thoughts? What kind of rules shall we adopt? I, I'm um, for the two minutes um, and limiting. I don't know if 90 minutes is um, necessary for a body of our size, but considering what you know, we did three hours a couple, a couple of meetings ago. Um, and um, I'm really strong about name, address. We used to do that in live. I, I remember we had a sign-up sheet there, name, address. Um, there was some discussion by one of the um, public commenters tonight about your affiliation with Northampton, work, live, um, did work, reside, whatever um, is helpful information, but I don't know how we can prioritize that other than the chair saying at the beginning of public comment, this is the way, this is how we, how we would like public comment to go. So those, those, three, those three pieces, time limit um, for the speaker and time limit for how long we would do public comment and um, identifying oneself um, sounds really good to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I agree with the two minutes. I agree with um, everything except that um, I can think of perhaps three occasions in the length of time that I've been on the board that we've had a very long public comment period. And I think in those instances, it would have not been to our advantage to set a time limit. I think that would be seen as um, not accommodating the input from the public that pe people are interested enough to sign on and uh, participate in it. I would not limit the length of time. I would like the, the length of time for each individual, but not the time period for public comment as a whole. It, it, we run into it so infrequently. Um, I, I, I would prefer not to. Um, I'm really, I have mixed, mixed feelings about, about this. And, and I have less, uh, I've served less time than any other members on the board. So you have a bigger uh, a, a sense for the history of public comments. Um, it clearly, you know, the events of December 28 were a little, extreme and don't seem to be very common. It's just a very passionate debate. Um, if, you know, if this is something that's not gonna repeat itself it's, and it's something like today or past meetings, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether we need to have uh, many rules in place beyond state you name and limit it to two minutes. And, and I agree, I don't think, you know, the 90 minutes doesn't really matter because it never happens. And sometimes it's necessary to have more than 90 minutes. Um, but if the intent is to prevent, uh, you know, comments boarding on, on, on prejudice or being clearly uh, uh, inappropriate, um, then stating your name and address is not effective. I'll just give a fake name and a fake address. <laughs> um, so do we want to go the route of verifying uh, through, okay, give me a cell phone number and I'm going to call you on your cell phone. And that seems very extreme as well. That seems very extreme if, you know, it's going to be a once in a lifetime uh, meeting that turns a little bit obnoxious. And, and it's going to be a lot of effort for preventing, you know. So at the end, I'm thinking those rules are fine, but why really, I'm, I'm not inclined to, you know, we're not going to make much of a change if we don't adopt those rules because it's pretty much what we've been doing all along. Perhaps you, Dr. Levin, you want to be more assertive in having people really state their name and city of residence before they can say anything because I've noticed a lot of people start speaking and, you know, user X number and obviously that's not, but, you know, nothing is going to prove us those identities are correct. Um, and whose names are real. And I saw that in public comment, I should point out, you know, you can usually tell when you read public comments, whether the sender is real or a clearly fake name, usually there's a pattern and I, you can tell. 
in public comment, you can probably guess. Um, but at the end, perhaps, you know, perhaps it doesn't really matter beyond, you know, I, I think we want relevance. Obviously a comment from a Northampton resident, taxpayer, student and so on is more relevant than comments from someone from uh, a remote location far away from Northampton who has no business or interest in Northampton. But that doesn't mean we can't have them speak as well. So at the end, I almost all of this to say, perhaps we can just keep it as it is and hope for the best next time there is a contentious subject. Well, I'd like to formalize our rules because it's not really written anywhere. Um, so if we say that we have public comment at the beginning of um, our meetings and each person will have two minutes to speak and they'll be asked to give their name, town, and uh, if they're willing, their affiliation with Northampton. Um, and just leave it at that, at least it'll be written somewhere. And that will be the sort of the standard. Um, and I think for the next time or for the future, if there's an issue that we have an awareness might be sort of a, a hot topic for the public, then instead of having it at the beginning of a meeting, I mean, we've done this before, is have it as a public forum. There is set aside a date where we have set aside the time and plenty of time for people to speak and it could go three hours, four hours, whatever it is. Um, but we have to sort of know, sort of anticipate that it's gonna be a hot issue in order to set that up ahead of time. Uh, but that would probably be the way to go. Um, that ended up being what we did anyway. Mm -hmm. It was just a public a public comment session for that for that one meeting. We didn't right. have a meeting. Right, right. But rather than being sort of surprised at that, if there's something that is that we anticipate would be a hot issue, not even plan to have a meeting and and advertise it as a public forum and encourage people to come. Um, so and, and, um, mm -hmm. I should point out that I, looking back at why there was so much, so many attendants at this meeting, 300, well, we were at the maximum capacity. But in looking back at the various social media, I noticed that the Northampton Board of Health announcement for that meeting had been forwarded like 400 times um, and was reaching groups. If you follow the trails of who is where is forwarding, it was going very far away. So these are maybe indicators. If you see like a degree of forwarding of, of, uh, of sharing in, on social media, that's unusual. Whoever is, is controlling the, uh, the feed on, on Facebook of the Northampton, that may be a good sign um, that it will be attended and not necessarily mm -hmm. attended by um, the, the local. And I just wanna add that I, if I could just reflect on my eight month experience on the police commission where we had public comment several times a week because we had several subcommittees. And um, we never limited public comment. In fact, um, on some, depending on the topic, we allowed um, seven to eight minutes in a few cases for the public to speak. Now, having said that, that was a, incredibly you know, open process. But one of the things that we did do that I'm really sad to hear tonight that we haven't been doing, and that is distributing every single document that is available to us when we distribute the agenda. Um, I don't know if that's being done or not. I kind of think maybe it's not, um, but I'm, I'm just not sure. And so in the interest of transparency, we have public comment, but we also have the individuals that want to really read up on what it is that we're discussing. And part of open meeting law is that we're not permitted to have a document until we present it in open meeting. So I'm hoping that whatever that process or procedure is that we can um, make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, but I do, um, we do have to do business. So I think not limiting the period of time, um, we just want to be cautious about that. And the chair always has the discretion to say, wow, we've got a lot of people here tonight. And so maybe we will extend that period. Um, so I just, with, 
you know, depending on what's what the agenda is or what we're dealing with, meeting once a month, we need to spend time to do to do our own work as well. So I think we should be able to have that flexibility. Um, so I, I'm sorry if it may sound like control or limiting, but um, we still have got to do our the business of, of the Board of Health. So. Um, can I add a little bit? Um, sure. After attending that meeting, and I've, I've spoke to a lot of people on the phone, um, and I have a Ex city councilor friend that was giving me some feedback regarding you know some things that they did. First, one of the things that I heard is that they they even have trouble just finding our meetings and our agenda. So the more clear we can be, and we've kind yeah. of been putting that into the policies and the Q and A's. Like here's where you can find it. Here's exactly how you find that link. Um, some of the other things that uh, my city councilor friend had said was that um, we maybe be a little more specific in your agenda of not just the topics uh she felt like what you know what that time limit is or how long public comment will be or won't be it will be open or um in the case that public comment you really couldn't do this ahead of time but because there were so many people on that um, there will be no vote tonight given the amount of attendees and we want to give the opportunity for the public to speak sometimes that more specific information might help them in their comments she thought um we often don't know if there's going to be a vote That's yeah a right right yeah. yeah true very true um she thought the more information in a way that you can give them that you can give them helps them you know, kind of maybe approach their comment a little differently. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else. It, it was really good feedback. Um, she also said sometimes when there's, well, the, the benefit of having so many attend is that if you were in a live meeting in a, in a room or, a, a, you know, that type of forum, 300 people wouldn't be able to attend. So it's really good that they can and have that opportunity. That was one of, you know, another piece of feedback. Do you think it would make sense to have our agendas sent to the city councilors because they often have listservs of people in their neighborhoods that are interested? I know yeah. I used to get notices from my city councilor about upcoming meetings, um, but never about the Board of Health. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Like how many ways can we get that out there? Um, yeah. To them? That was definitely, a, yeah, it's a concern, but they, can't seem to, you know, they want to know how to, you know, find the agenda. Like it's an education process for that group. Like you can find it here. You can find it on the <clears throat> city calendar. You can find it on the board of health. Um, Shouldn't be that hard, but it no. is not so easy actually. Yeah, right. I, 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 in my trying to do Q and A's and stuff, here's where you can find it. I really like a step by step, you know, in the agenda PDF, click on that. You'll find the Zoom they meet on the third month or as needed, uh, excuse me, third Thursday of every month at 5.30 and as needed, like just give it to them. And reiterate that there are other forms of giving public comment. Um, I know some people told me they couldn't um, either get through or they had wrong email addresses or something to get through the email. So um, always reiterating, you don't have to come. You can also send us and we read everything. Yeah. yeah, I actually meant to say that tonight, and I forgot to say that <laughs> people can 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 send us email anytime through the city website. Uh, I'm trying to discourage people using our private emails, um, but we do get all the comments, the written comments that are sent to the Department of Health. I added that in the facts too. <laughs> I'm just Great. adding it. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like we're all in agreement about a two minute limit. We're not all in agreement about whether we should limit the total time of um, of the discussion of the public comment. Um, and that we would like to have the name, I don't know about address, but at least the town of residence and the affiliation with Northampton if someone's willing, but at least the town they live in. Does that sound reasonable? Um, and I would propose that, uh, that we consider having a dedicated public forum for issues that we think will draw a lot of public comment. Um, there's one other thing that was in the 
um, the um, city council regs. I just have to find it again. It did say, and someone mentioned that earlier, there's a separate section. Oh, one second, let me just find it. Um, um, public comment, conduct 4.7. There is one line here that says, uh, it's a separate paragraph from public comment. It says conduct city councilors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. Um, do we want to include that? And does that give us the ability to exclude people who um, do not conduct themselves with civility and respect? I don't know who makes that judgment call. I, I yeah. just use the chair. Uh, that, I was concerned about that. Um, obviously, it was a very difficult to endure some of the um, statements that were made and the visuals that were presented. I don't know where the law, the line is for free speech. I can um, tell you what Alan, I asked uh, attorney Seawald and let me bring up his email um, because I don't know if, if having that section is going to change um, what he would say. Um, he says, um, I was asking him what is grounds for excluding someone from a meeting. He says, I understand your confusion, but there aren't always bright lines and rules to apply. There are some judgment calls to be made. Um, for instance, is someone who see, simply says F you um, should be silenced and removed. Someone who uses a vulgarity casually in a sentence, like some people just occasionally do, shouldn't necessarily be silenced. Between those two examples are a thousand variations. Some will fall on one side of the balance and others on the other side. Certain language that is not protected by the First Amendment at all would include statements causing false panic, such as yelling fire in a crowded theater, and fighting words, those words that would cause a reasonable person to respond with immediate violence. But those are very narrow exceptions. Um, and his understanding is that uh, he's clear that speech that is rude, offensive, disrespectful, caustic, critical, demeaning, or even defamatory cannot be excluded. Um, but that's opposite from what he said earlier. Um, so that's still confusing to me. But those were um, Attorney Sewell's comments. The person that I spoke with, Dr. Levin, was if it makes you feel unsafe, like it's threatening and unsafe, just like if they were in the room with you, it's really the same in, in Zoom. So that is kind of a, a maybe a way of uh, trying to figure what is okay and what's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it all will end up being a judgment call and um, we'll have to do our best. I guess the question is whether we want to have a comment which must be legal because city council did it, um, that conduct we will, we and the public need to act with civility and respect. I guess I could ask Alan Seawald about that if you'd like. Could we, um, I, I know at some point in the middle school there was an issue with the, the Zoom classroom with the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how this issue was settled. I know the Americans, <laughs> Civil Liberties Union got involved. Um, it's, it's not the it's it's not a product acronym to to draft language on how to proceed. I, and I don't think we need to necessarily get there. But it's, I just want to. I'm just curious. What? How did they handle it in the end? I don't remember. Anybody else? I, did, I just um. You know, in an education <laughs> environment where I teach at UMass, we cannot. We cannot suggest anything that triggers another student's um, feeling of being safe. And, and there's consequences for doing that. But so that's in an education environment. In but a can government- you, Can you clarify what you mean by that? So if there were, so you are not allowed to use any language that would be a trigger or the other students are not allowed as well? 
Um, we, we, uh, I'm coming from the faculty perspective. So we, we, sh we should be very, very careful not to trigger a student's emotions. And um, oftentimes we're not sure what, you could be teaching a piece of literature, right? And you're just not sure what might trigger. So it's a, it's a tough ground to, to walk. Um, however, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of guidance in place, but in an open government meeting, I think there's a different set of rules. So the con Confederate flag in a middle school, I can see where there is a lot of protection in, in um, removing something like that. I'm not sure we can do that. And I think Attorney Sewell was saying hate speech is, is free speech. And the Supreme Court has said that as well. It is free speech. And so I think the, the terminology that city council used, and they probably put this in after um, the George Floyd um, uh, murder when they had uh, several hours, multiple hours of, of, of public comment, um, that, that the term civility and respect, um, they're, yes, they can be defined differently by all of us, but sort of a mutually understood um, terminology. And to put it in there to just be that, okay, so that's what they're looking for so that it's not like a, a free for all. Whether it does good or bad or harm, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I, don't, I don't think it, uh, I wouldn't mind leaving it in, but if, if people feel strongly about removing it, that's fine with me as well. I guess I'm, I'm confused about what our mandate is. If our mandate is to ensure free speech or if our mandate is to have public comment with whatever rules that we want to put in place. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That if we say we want conduct with civility and respect, then we are allowed to ask for that and eliminate people who don't do that. So I, I, I guess I think to clarify that with the with the mayor and, and with, with Alan Sewell. There aren't any consequences listed for that. It's sort of an aspirational statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, rather than um, a, a, a regulation or a policy. It's, it's please, would you please act with civility and respect? But However, when, it, when it happens during a meeting, that's what's difficult. You know, it's, it's what, what is enough or what topic or what is enough for you to essentially cut people off? That, that's what we're talking about. Cut people off or, or, or cut off their video. And I, I think that's real shaky ground for us to do. Well, I guess that's the question. Do, do we have to maintain the First Amendment free speech or can we set up whatever rules we want and we use our best judgment? We're a um, governmental and, body. Well, if, right. if, if you have two minutes, you're, you have two minutes and then you're cut off. If you operate in a, a sort of a webinar fashion, like we're trying to around with technology now, um, this stuff wouldn't be visible. So I think there's enough, enough tools in place um, structurally on Zoom. Now, if, if this happened in a live meeting, you know, we might call the police, you know, if we felt unsafe, we might do that. So we have to think about the context. Was there at any point in the past in your uh, working on the board where you felt unsafe at a meeting? Not in person, but on December 28th. Um, yeah, no, I understand, excluding mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. we've, we've been threatened before during yeah. this. Um, we never had to physically remove someone. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we 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 have been called names. We have been um, very uh, unkind things have been said about us um, in in public comment, but it's public comment. Yeah, yeah. and and um, we can take it. It, it. it went over a line. Certainly, I don't know. I don't know what we would have done differently. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when I had a talk with Joe Comerford a few weeks ago, uh, I was asking her um, how she would approach that. And she said, well, in, in, in hearings anyway, which is different from a board meeting, but in a hearing, it's expected that people will conduct themselves with civility and respect. She didn't use those words, uh, but people can be asked to be 
removed from the room um, if they are disruptive. Um, so, you know, if you had people heckling or, you know, that wouldn't that sort of doesn't happen on Zoom, but, that, but that's something that would happen in person. Um, so there are reasons why people can be removed um, if they're disrupting the, the, the meeting. Of course. Yeah. Um, so um, I would like to just, I would like to uh, ask for if anyone would like to make a motion about what our rules will be, and maybe we should make the minimum rules that we all agree on, and then we can talk about other rules um, in addition or come back to them another time. Um, but I would like to get something um, on paper so that going forward, everyone knows what the rules are. Um, can I ask a question? There's a sentence in here about language translation, which mm. we have never addressed as far as I know. Is that language translation expected to be provided by the speaker? We don't have the capacity to translate languages. Actually, in the uh, live transcript, they that we do have that capacity. We do. I believe so. In a live transcript, okay, but so that's a sort of a written thing. I don't really know how it works um, to um, in public comment. Maybe if um, someone someone brings a translator with them, I don't really know. Amy, do you have any idea? I don't. I don't. I, I know that on Apple phones, you can talk right into it in your translator that's a part of the app and it will translate for you. So it personal ability to do it in some people's cases, but not everybody's. I guess that was just a clause that was put in there because it just takes more time. So right. it doesn't really tell us how that happens or who's responsible for it. Right. And and there is the sentence about um, the discretion of the chair to extend the time. Yep. Which is that, which is which is a great gives us a great wiggle room. That's for the I assume that means the time of two minutes. Exactly. Not the 90 minutes. Oh so if someone needed two minutes. translation, the discretion of the chair would be to extend the time. So I would not include that sentence. Okay. I would not include the sentence about the um, length of time of 90 minutes, and I would not include this, the following sentence about language translation. So do you want to make, does anybody want to make a proposal, make a um, motion? Um, I propose to adopt the rules um, that have been adopted by the city council changing the name of council to the board uh, without the sentence about the public comment limitation and without the sentence about language translation and adding the sentence about civility that you spoke about. Any, uh, is there a second for that motion? Yeah, I'll second it. Any other discussion? discussion? Go ahead. Discussion? Yeah. I just want to just clarify, even though the chair can say we set 60 minutes or 90 minutes or seven hours, even though the chair can override that, what's the harm in putting a time limit in? I'm just curious. I think it gives the impression that we're trying to silence public input. I also wonder if there were many people that showed up, how we would choose who got to speak and who didn't. If we don't have a sort of a sign up or some kind of way to you know who got there first, or I, I don't even know how we would do that. Any other comments about the motion? Kelly, you um, you with us? Yes. Okay, great. 
Um, all right, we will put it to a vote. All in favor of um, the rules as specified by Suzanne, which are the rules um, as listed by the city council, except changing the name to the board of health, um, not including the 90 minute limit, not including language translation because that's assumed to be covered by um, discretion of the chair and adding um, that conduct will be with uh, for the board members and the public uh, will conduct themselves with civility and respect. Um, all, are we ready for a vote? No other comments? I just, I just did want to comment that I think it is very good that this uh, rule includes the, the fact that we do not respond to comments. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's, I mean, do we want to add something about, um, no, never mind about the about the fact that we don't respond to the public during meetings. I think that's something that I can Fine. announce. Um, so basically, we're taking what's written here for the city council and sort of additions and deletions, as you mentioned. Um, so leaving those last couple of sentences in. Um, all in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you very much. So now we have our rules um, that we can, um, we can even put on our agenda if we wanted to um, so that the public knows what the rules are for public comment session. Um, excellent. Thank you. Um, let me just see where we are. If there's something else on our agenda. Minutes. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is really going to be painful. All right. Let's start on 1216 because those are really old. Does everybody have the minutes? I was a little confused, Kelly, under old business. Vaccination requirement at the senior center, it just says change definition of fully vaccinated individuals. I don't see that that was a vote. That was on a later meeting. Um, what was that, a discussion? That was a discussion you guys were going to discuss whether you, you were going to add um, boosted as part of the vaccination definition on we the did, policy. But we didn't vote on that at that meeting. No, you guys had discussed it, but there was no no vote taken. Okay, so maybe uh, we would add. Um, a discussion took place, something like this. Discussion yeah. of definition of. Discussion yeah. of change. Do you need me to take notes, Kelly, and send you the, the files? If you want, because I'm looking at two um, two versions here. So Suzanne, I have the version with Suzanne Jay, sent me her Jay comments Elliott. and I have Dr. Levin's oh. comments as well. So really what we should be doing is um, I would give my, do the first edit and then the next, um, when those go out to you, you should bring your comments to the meeting. Let me see if I can share my screen. I didn't have luck last time. Um, can you see that? We can see a nice dog and some smiley nice, owners. Nice grand dog there, Joanne. What? Oh, why don't you see what I have in front of me? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> that didn't work too well. Kelly, can you share the document that I sent you? Um, yes, let me open that one. I thought all the documents we had had your initials on them, Joanne. It said J J O. So, so I'm assuming that that's. They really had good. her edits in them. Okay, right, right. So I will. That was my only question on those minutes was what that 
agenda item was about. Um, did anybody have any other comments on the 12, 16 minutes? I had a couple proposed edits, but they're not important. They're really two, two word changes that aren't important. Well, now we've got it in front of us. So on uh, the highlighted yellow, instead of uh, uh, that was discussion. To consider, does that look right? Yeah. Change in definition. Change in de That's fine. Changing. So, any um, Suzanne, while we're here, do you want to um, say what your uh, it's, minor it's, changes were? It's not important. Okay. Any other uh, yes. changes you want on these minutes? Yeah. Paragraph B. Uh, in the past 14 days. Which, which section? Which Roman numeral? Oh, 3B. 3B. Mm -hmm. In the past 14 days, second sentence, comma. We have a uh, no, 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 comma, and the incident rates. All right. Then fully dosed. Can we come up with something different? Because I don't know if it's a clear term, fully dosed. If, if everybody is happy with it, then I'll shut up but primary series is what i would say is that what the re reference is to, to the first uh, dosing, not not boosters where are we right down one here. yeah so i probably been have received the primary series is that a what full, you said or a full primary series yeah so uh, yep uh, Okay, yeah. All right, my last comment is you see that 2050 cases in the same, in the paragraph further previously? Yes. yes. Right there, yeah. Well, the, the week later, the next set of minutes is two, 2030. So one number is wrong. So we'll have to check and change it. Check whatever numbers, because obviously there should be more cases the week after. So either that's one. That's one is too high or the next one is too low. Okay. And then the last comment I had, it's at the very bottom at C. I, I don't know what the difference between the most vulnerable populations and high risk populations. I was thinking about that. And I'm wondering if most vulnerable means, for example, homeless people as opposed to high risk populations, meaning people with diabetes. Or those in um, nursing homes? Yeah, high risk meaning medically high risk and vulnerable meaning well, well, otherwise elderly, vulnerable. Elderly could be vulnerable. Um, so Meredith is not here and Vivian is not here. Um, I, I'm okay to the extent, I, I, you know, I'm sure the minutes can put, I, I will approve to the extent this is addressed and we put, you know, we, we clarify what this is, but other than that, let's... Oh, do you want to highlight that, Kelly? And you can ask um, Meredith or Vivian uh, what they would put there. And uh, you guys are willing to go with whatever corrections they have. Yes. yes. Okay, anything else on the December 16th minutes? That's all for me. Cynthia, do you have anything? No, I do on December 28th, but not on 16th. Anybody else? Uh, is there a motion? Motion to approve the meetings uh, of the minutes of the meeting on December 16th with the uh, change that we discussed this evening. Second. Any other comments, questions? All in favor, Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. Um, so Kelly, when you check with Meredith or Vivian about how they think those should be changed, can you just send me the final version? Yes. Please? Thank you. All right, the next minutes are the 1228, right? And before we move on this, I'm hoping we can uh, delay the January 13th because it was, there were more, la more, more language I wanted to change and I didn't get, I didn't get to it. So if we can table these. 
but I can do yes. December 28th, but I want to table January 1st, uh, January 13th. Okay. Um, so my only comment to these was uh, 3C. Oh, can you show your screen? Yep. So just flag the 3C because that's where the 2030 case is. Mm. It's possible that in early December, it did go down before it went up again. Well, but that's the total cumulative case, 2000. Oh, okay. Then you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the second page, uh, on my paragraph, Dr. Levy, blah, 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 it's come back for questions. So there's an extra four back to delete. Uh-huh. And that's all for me. I would like to add um, under 3C, uh, this not, does not include the positive cases with home antigen tests. Okay. It's in the second line of C under local data. Can you see that? Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. under two. Wait, so yeah, home antigen tests as opposed to proctored antigen tests? as opposed to well what vivian calls proctored antigen tests i don't know who's doing them but there are some where they are someone is doing it for someone as opposed to someone doing it at home at home mm -hmm. i think it's the home antigen tests that are not counted by and large. Mm -hmm. um under two old business it just says review mask order it doesn't didn't we defer that to the next meeting to a future meeting? There, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, so we didn't do it at that we meeting. We didn't do it. So it was on the agenda, but we didn't do it. Right, so I would just put uh, this item was deferred until a future meeting. Or we could just take it off the minutes because it wasn't. Or take it off the minutes, right. Yeah, we could just take it off the minutes because it wasn't discussed. Just to, and just take off that whole thing. Even though it was on the agenda, it wasn't and discussed. Right. Then everything, then the number three mm -hmm. needs to be changed to two. Yep. Anything else? That's all I have. Me too. Cynthia, anything? I have the same thing of uh, the mask. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, does someone want to make a motion? A motion Move. to approve the meeting minutes with the change we discussed this evening. Second. Any other comments or questions? All in favor, Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. And we will um, come back to the minutes from the 13th because you just got those and um, uh, they require a little more input. So we will bring those next time. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Um, let me look back at my agenda. Where is my so Joanne, can I just go back to like something I think you said a couple of minutes ago, or Kelly, I'm sorry, I don't remember who said it. So the process should be for you to make edits, Joanne, and then those are sent out as the ones for us to edit. And those edits should be done during the meeting. Yeah, I think that's the way the standard procedure is because we are not allowed to work on a document together because of right. our meeting law. Right. I thought we were um, to send them to Kelly. I thought we were to send them to Kelly and then yeah. she would do a revised document. Yeah, I guess I sort of feel like as the chair, I should have the power to see the edits before they go out. Um, so it just got, it just gets too complicated because often those minutes don't happen till a few days before the meeting and then I review them and then it, you know then it's a day before the meeting and then if you send something to Kelly and I haven't seen those changes it just you know if if it just gets complicated I think I know it's sort of a pain in the neck to do at the meeting it's less than ideal but I'm not sure that's I just that I just sense. think that's a better way to do it um, I was operating under the old model so uh, I'll just bring them to the meeting. Right. Thank I won't you. bother Kelly with it. <laughs> Thank You're you. You're off the hook, Kelly. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so we did our old business, we did our new business, and we reviewed our minutes. On the agenda, it said January 6th, but it, we didn't have a meeting on January 6th. Yeah, I um, changed it to the 13th. Okay. Um, great. Um, and as far as future meetings, so we're going to keep both of our planned, let me get my calendar out. Um, we had already planned to be meet on February 17th, and now we have added February 3rd. So Kelly, a question, I know that when we, the way we announce a meeting is by posting an agenda. Um, is there a way to put up, sort of post that we're having a meeting before we have the agenda set, like a way to publicize it, publicize it further ahead of time? Because we tend to post, you know, the required 72 hours, but I think the public might welcome knowing it ahead of time because now we know. We right, I, I, can, I can check with city council if I can actually schedule the meetings for like the full year without actually having an agenda up mm -hmm. there with it. I think well, they generally like the meeting and the agenda posted at the same time, mm -hmm. but I can definitely check on that. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say that we want to uh publicized meetings for the entire year because as things get closer and we need to change right <coughs> excuse me but but a few weeks ahead rather than a few days ahead i think might be a welcome welcome change so that would be great if we could figure that out if like there's a way the, to like post it. the first of the month <coughs> or as soon as we know soon right we now know two weeks ahead and four weeks ahead okay. um so uh we can work on that um, if you find out the answer to that, Kelly, would you let me know? Yes, I will. Thank you. And then um, I think Vivian tends to put them on social media, um, but I'm wondering if she could also send them to the city councilors when we when they're put up. Um, the the agendas or post the announcement of the meetings or whatever because they can send those out to their listservs and things like that. I don't know, just, uh, does anyone have other ideas about how to publicize our meeting dates and, uh, and agendas? I mean, I can definitely include the city councilors when I send it to um, the board. Mm -hmm. Does that sound reasonable? You guys want to do that? That's good. Okay. Awesome. Did we Thank need you. to discuss the the document that are attached? Yeah, I think it? we would. Um, I I think I should ask um, Attorney Seawald about that because uh, I think I remember him mentioning that he was not in favor of doing that. Um, so let me get some uh, information from him about that. Okay. Anything else? Just a quick one. Um, and if, I don't know who does this, but um, last I checked, um, myself and Laurent are listed as having expired terms on the um, city oh, website. Yeah. So I just thought um, hmm. it would be good to clean that up. Sure. And I think we did get extended this summer by the city council. If yes, you look at the we did. But um, did you do your swearing and all that stuff? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So then we're good. It should be extended. All right, I'll check with the mayor's office on that. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Where was that listed, Cynthia? Just if you go to the Northampton Board of Health, all our, our terms, oh. main and terms are listed there. That's I true. We're, we're list, you, I, I remember now, Cynthia and I expired in June 2021. And oh, Suzanne's cell phone. <laughs> and I'm even I'm even up to date on my conflict of interest training <laughs> which actually I noticed is supposed to be taken every other year except mm. since I term at three years you have to remember to do it mm. yes Lauren <laughs> doesn't the city clerk send out that notification you know things slip during COVID 
Yeah, that's what they did. Yeah, yeah. yeah they did. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So move, I will, we'll see you in. Uh, oh, move, Cynthia? Move, move to adjourn. Yeah, good idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> second, is there? Do I hear a second? A second. Excellent. Any discussion? All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. So we are adjourned at 8 19 p.m.